moderator, we have the research fellow of PIDS and chair of the PASCN Review Committee. Welcome please, Dr. Ramonet Serafika. Uh, good morning. I hope you don't mind if I just stay here because uh, otherwise you have to go there five times. So, um, welcome to the session on the research studies and innovation projects by the University of the Philippines. In this session, we will learn about the current programs of the University of the Philippines that aim to develop competencies and establish the country's comparative advantage as it veers towards the fourth industrial revolution. Our first speaker for today is Attorney Emerson Banyes. He will talk about regulatory issues on fintech and blockchain. Attorney Banyes is an associate professor at the UT College of Law. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, each speaker will be given 15 minutes. And Mark over here, uh, please raise your hand. Or uh, yeah, he will be our timekeeper for this morning. So, Attorney Banyes. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, uh, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, and I apologize if uh, you were uh, expecting Professor to see and uh, you'd have to. Uh, Settle for uh, a substitute. Uh, can I just slide uh, over, please? Okay, so uh, you know, I I heard earlier you know, references to the fourth uh, industrial revolution, and um, you know, many of the a lot of our you know, many laws, you know, a lot of laws that we that we have right now are a product of you know dealing with that first industrial revolution. Um, you know, the reason why we have you know, a, an eight-hour workday, the reason why we have weekends, you know, the reason why we have uh, regulations of, uh, of banks and financial institutions uh, is because uh, you know, uh, law had to, had to deal with, you know, had to deal with uh, the offshoots of the industrial revolution. All right, so okay. sorry. Okay, so um, I am talking about. I'm going to talk about um, how the law will deal with a. Uh, all right. So at the, the first industrial revolution was also characterized with developments in finance. You know? Well, some of the you know some of the you know some of those tools, financial tools, uh, you know, like uh, were developed prior to the industrial revolution, but they were certainly you know developed to a certain degree, if not perfected, uh, during the industrial revolution. So. Um, Okay, so the study that uh, I'm presenting concerns fintech, financial technology, uh, alongside, you know, alongside. Uh, So alongside, um, okay. So the study deals with fintech, right? Uh, alongside the technological developments you, you saw earlier, would be developments in in, in financial technology. Um, I'm not just talking about building a web or app-based interface to traditional banking. Traditional banking functions, although that certainly will be part of fintech. Uh, fintech will enable all sorts of new ways of transacting, of, of transmitting value, of 
of structuring economic activities uh, that may or may not be covered by existing, you know, by existing banking functions, or by existing contracts. Um, FinTech does not yet have uh, a, an established uh, statutory meaning under, uh, under Philippine law, but uh, some speeches from the BSP you know, have, uh, have extended it to, you know, to, 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 uh, to, any, to any development, uh, to any technological development in, uh, in finance. Uh, okay, so technology and the law. Normally, you know, when technology when technology develop incrementally, you know, it was slow enough for the law to adjust. You know, when when we were dealing with paper instruments, you know, uh, it, it was a matter of just. You know, the law could, could, could develop slowly. You know, it, it could, uh, you know, or it could either legislation could catch up, or the courts can say, ah, you know, uh, this particular legal concept can apply to, you know, to the new instrument, to the new co form of contract uh, by analogy. Right? The problem now is that law is uh, technology is developing so quickly. That you know, the law often does not have time uh, to adjust. Uh, when disruptive te technologies arrive, uh, when when disruptive technologies arrive, uh, often you find the law you know, does not have does not have the tools to be able to uh, to deal with the new technology, with the effects of the new technology. Uh, so. It's a problem for, for regulators because you know, they, they don't have the tool set to be able to, to uh, you know, control the, the effects of this technology. At the same time, it will be a problem for the industry because you know, their technology, their commercial arrangements will not, you know, it's, it's, it's up and limbo whether or not they should comply. And so that uncertainty can, you know, uh, can limit their growth. Okay, so each each regulatory regime is based on an ontology, meaning it's a model. You know, each regulator would have a model of the industry inside his head. You know, who are the actors? You know, what are the transactions? What are the processes? Right, and then based on that model provided by the law and inside the regulator's head, you know. He can make decisions whether or not, ah, yes, this is this should be covered by the law, this should be controlled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem is, you know, the problem now is, new technologies will bring in new concepts that may or may not be, you know, covered by that ontology, with that internal model of what the industry is in the first place, what the components are of that of that industry, and therefore the norms that should apply. You know, to that to that industry. Let's take for example the case of Uber, right? Uh, for 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 the for the LTFRB for the LTO, you know the internal model of the regulator is you know, ah you know there are vehicles, there are routes, you know, um, you're either a common carrier or a private you know, a private entity. You're just a private driver, and there's nothing else. That's that's the, the that's the only thing that my Regulatory ontology, my model can accommodate. And now comes this technology, you know, this company saying that you know, are they common carriers? Right? Are 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 they you know are, are, is every is every ride a private transaction or is this is, is it somewhere in between? You know? uh, the problem is you know, the, problem, the existing law, you know, common carriers developed during the first or after the first industrial revolution does not have you know, quite you know, uh, the, the same level of granularity, you know, of uh, 
that, that can handle this particular type of uh, technology. So, one part of the study is developing a methodology for capturing the ontology of the law. Uh, by ontology, you know, I don't mean I don't mean it in the philosophical sense of you know what is real, what is the truth. I oh, I, I I refer to ontology uh, based on the computer science uh, meaning of it. It's a data structure. So what I am doing is um, capturing the actors, the transactions, the processes that are present in the law, the structures between those actors and processes. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying. We're trying to, to encode uh, legal concept, legal concepts, and legal norms applicable to the traditional financial industry, and see if they are applicable to the new fintech industry. So, so we're trying to to bridge the gap between uh, the old financial industry and the new fintech industry by analyzing the laws and. You know, we're trying to cut through the, uh, the, the regulatory uncertainty that I described uh, earlier. So, uh, some an application of ontology uh, of, of uh, ontologies that you may be familiar with. Uh, to a certain extent, Google can already recognize quote unquote some concepts. You know, when you when you search for Thomas Jefferson. It already understands that you mean the president, the actor that is the president, and then all the related actors which are also president. So uh, this is the technological basis for for ontologies. Um, it, it's based on, on on the standards that we already have today. So the technology is already existing to be able to capture legal concepts, meaning the actors, the processes, and reduce it into a data structure that can be processed by computers. So this is the basis of, of that encoding, naming a concept, and then uh, naming an attribute, and then uh, providing the data for that particular attribute. So eventually, you know, these simple concepts, this simple triple uh, simple structure structures called triples can be built on top of each other to create more concept, more complex uh, conceptions of uh, the law. So this is an example taken from an existing ontology or framework ontology called the Legal Knowledge Interchange Format. Now, it's like if it's like a um, like I said, it's a framework you know, that enables. Um, uh, those interested in encoding laws, you know, a, a pre-existing uh, scaffolding you know, on, on, on top uh, to build their work uh, from. Right. So this is an example of uh, an ontology we already constructed before. Uh, this is just one concept. You know, one concept in the law called you know, the concept of a quasi-delic. Right? And uh, we were able to uh, we were able to input this in the computer and based on the encoding we were able to draw some conclusions you know, derived from automated analysis. Of course, many of those conclusions were already existing based on the works of scholars, but this is this this was one of the first times where those conclusions were derived from uh, from automated analysis. Right. So, some concepts that, that some some problems that we that we may find based on automated analysis, uh, a computer may find that a law or regulations uh, use inconsistent terms. It may find that a law is subject to overlapping jurisdictions. So it's a matter of you know, uh, for example, in, in in fintech nowadays, SEC saying. You know, to the extent that, that virtual currencies are, are, are securities, it's our problem. And the DSP saying, no, they're currencies, they're our problem, right? So what, that's one of the few things that an automated analysis can, can, can help us discover. And then uh, it may help us discover gaps, meaning concepts, 
not covered by existing technologies as well as um, uh, norms that may conflict with higher or other norms. So the rest of the study for now is just going through the laws that we have already, you know, we have already, uh, we are already mapping. So there's a lot of laws that uh, we need to be able to encode. And then these are the laws that FinTech companies should be able to take note of. Uh, whether or not the precise norms are applicable to them, uh, that may still be uh, subject to, a, to, to further analysis. So, the rest of the the rest of the presentation just covers uh, all all the laws that may contain norms uh, that may applicable that are applicable to the tra traditional financial sector, but may or not may or not may or may not be sub uh, applicable to the fintech sector. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Attorney Banyas. I hope we can talk to you later because the IDS is also working on a study on financial services. So the, the next topic for this morning is Disaster Risk Reduction and Management with Project NOAA. Our presenter is Dr. Alfredo Mahar Lagmay, who is the prof a professor of National Institute of Geological Sciences, College of Science, University of the Philippines, Diliman, and, uh, and he is also the executive director of the UP Resilience Institute. Uh, Dr. Lagmay.
for the next speaker. May I, I think, I, uh, may I ask Attorney Banes, uh, I actually have a question for you. <laughs> so, so, uh, so it's very interesting that you pointed out, as we've all realized, that uh, laws are no longer uh, up to date with uh, changing technologies. But I think this is a constant issue. So I was wondering what is the implication of um, what is the implication on lawmaking with regard to the disruptive technologies? Does this mean, therefore, that the constitution, for example, or laws, general laws, should just be uh, should just contain policy, general policy objectives and or regulatory principles, rather than be very prescriptive in how they define? Uh, the behavior of industries. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's, it's, uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very interesting question. It, it, it relates to uh, uh, a lot of philosophical you know, conversations about uh, the nature of the law itself, as well as you know what the law is is for. Uh, you know, I come from programming. You know, I come from the world of programming before I became a lawyer, and uh, I thought, you know, prior to entering law school, that you know, the law is supposed to be rational, right, logical, and that it's it should always respond, you know, it should always be the the, the result of you know, uh, uh, objective analysis. But uh, of course, you know, after after law school, I don't I don't think that that way anymore too much. Anyway. Uh, and, a lot of the law, you know, a lot of the law, some some parts of the law are, are can be logical, things that relate to uh, things that relate to, to business, you know, to commerce, and that particular layer, yes, we can, you know, we can uh, we we can we can build based on you know, based on actual feedback from, uh, from from all stakeholders. At the same time, there's 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 part of the law that's uh, that's aspirational. You know? uh, they are not the result of an analysis of the facts of what's out there, but based on values, based on long-held beliefs, uh, based on a model of how a person should be, and as to and a belief on, you know, on how society should be. So parts of the constitution uh, are, are aspirational, and I, I don't think. Even if you want to, we can we can touch them. You know, we've, we've been we've, we've been going back and forth, you know, regarding uh, foreign ownership of industries, for example. You know, some some economists think this does not make sense from a from a purely rational pr perspective. You know, it doesn't make sense to limit our markets that way. But it comes from, you know, like I said, aspirational values, uh, who we are as Filipinos, our history. So. I don't think we may, may, you know, it's, it's an easy task to just, to just touch those provisions. So we can be selective. You know, uh, we, we can go through the architecture of, of our law. The core things that are related to aspirations, maybe not, but uh, some, some ears uh, can be subject to uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of rational debate that uh, you refer to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Banias. Uh, I think at this stage, we'll move on to uh, the fourth speaker. Uh, yes. Yes. Ah, OK. So uh, Dr. Lagmay, uh, you have the floor. The, the conference is about technology. It's really disruptive. Disruptive technology. Yes. Uh, disruptive technology. Yeah. Disruptive. Uh, anyway, are we? Are you ready? Uh, we have a low battery for the laptop. <laughs> anyway, for uh, just, just to start while we're waiting, um, I hope everybody knows about NOAA uh, because you paid for that. Uh, that was a lot of money invested by government starting in 2012, uh, roughly about 6 million pesos. And uh, that is the kind of technology uh, that was made and was operational until 2017 with the NDRRMC. And that technology was supposed to 
uh, put in place a responsive program for disaster risk reduction and management. And now NOAA is uh, with the University of the Philippines. Uh, we try to still put up all of the uh, assets or all of the tools that we thought were necessary for saving lives. And that is still up and running uh, in the website called noaa.up.edu.ph. No, it's a long battery. I think this is sabotage. No. <laughs> we're waiting, do you have any questions about <laughs> Noah? <laughs> why, why don't we just put it in my laptop? I'm sure that one works. was uh, uh, in 2012 after Sendong. I hope this is additional time for me. Yes. Okay. The idea was after Sendong, uh, something needed to be done. And it was the order of the Secretary of the OST upon the orders of the President during that time after Sendong to put in place that responsive program for disaster risk reduction. And the idea was to put together all of the research and development technologies, research and development products, mostly coming from the academe and the university, and put them into operation. So that is that type of research wherein we have uh, what we call as operational research. It's something akin or similar to the research being done by faculty members of the Philippine General, General Hospital of the University of the Philippines, wherein they practice their research while doing their work. So there are patients in PGH, and they not only teach, but also do research at the same time. So that is the type of research called as operational research. Uh, one of the types of research, uh, the others being, um, uh, uh, what do you call this? policy research, and translational research. So NOAA is basically operational research. We need to be uh, included in the operations of government for us to learn the lessons of disaster risk reduction, learn the lessons or the hard lessons of actual disasters. And throughout the past two decades, we put together all of those lessons uh, in, uh, whenever there's a disaster and the reason why we put them together and write policy papers about it, it's actually derived from the operational research. And that is the kind of product that we put forward so that we do not repeat the same mistakes. And unfortunately, the, the lessons, whenever you want to rectify them, can be disruptive. So it disrupts the current system, and it's something similar also to disruptive technologies. But I'd like to emphasize that we have multiple technologies in Project NOAA. So it's not the technically disruptive technology, but I'd rather call it as disruptive science. So that is the kind of new approach that uh, uh, destabilizes the industry, or destabilizes the, the approach in our DRR efforts. Uh, here in the Philippines. Are we ready? Well, uh, okay. So, um, so much for the introduction. So my 15 minutes starts now. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, according to the definition, a disruptive technology 
is one that displaces an established technology and shakes up the industry, or a groundbreaking product that creates a completely new industry. As I said, uh, and what the first speaker said, uh, I think there was a mention about uh, technology is a tool. So we're using technology as a tool to create a new approach, and hence I'd rather call this as disruptive science or a disruptive scientific system, that one that displaces an established methodology and shakes up the industry or a groundbreaking approach that creates a completely new order. So I think that the last word, I was uh, trying to look for a good word uh, that would, put in, uh, that would uh, uh, replace uh, the definition of disruptive science. So, so I'm still working on that. Uh, maybe we can change or I can change that last word order into something else. Uh, in our studies over the past two decades, we found out that it is very important that our disaster risk reduction efforts in the country involve these two or three uh, very important elements. And I'm happy to announce that uh, Congress just approved a bill, I think two weeks ago or last week, that includes these three elements. The vote was 181, 5, and 2 abstain. So I'd like to give this talk to be able to convince you that these three elements need to be retained in the approved ver version of House Bill 8165, which is the creation of the Disaster Department of Disaster Resilience. It's going to be put up in the Senate, and hopefully you have friends that you can talk to, that uh, probably you heard this talk, on why these three elements are very important. Currently, we are not using it, these three. There are some sectors that use it and uh, push for it, but not on a nationwide scale. And I'm happy to tell you that uh, DOST ASTI, uh, who has been a partner for a long time, has been pushing for towards uh, pushing for open data, which is the second bullet point. If I have time, I'll talk about the last bullet point, which is hazard-specific area of focus and time-bound warnings, if, if there's still time. This is a graph uh, made uh, by EMDAT, and it shows you a timeline from 2000 to 2017. I think it's not the entire 2017 that's included, but if you see the number of lives lost from hazards, uh, before 2013, which is the year when we had uh, Yolanda, there were many deaths from natural hazards. And then after 2013, we can see the graph uh, to average at a very low level. So something happened in the system of government with the way we address disasters or natural hazard impacts. And I think that can be manifested as well in this timeline of disasters. I posted this on Twitter, by the way, and on Facebook, so that the senators uh, will be able to see that. Uh, so if you have friends who are up there who are going to decide on whether we really need this probabilistic risk assessment contained in the law so that we will be able to do that, please do so. I beg you to do so because this means life and death. You can see here in this graph uh, a timeline of disasters and the major policies. The blue field above the black line refers to averted disasters, while the pink field below the black line refer to actual disasters of a hazard that impacts a village or a community, wherein there's mass loss of lives. Whenever we have a hazard that is widespread, or like, for example, strong winds, a typhoon, and deaths uh, happen in one barangay and then in the other province in one barangay, that is not what I refer to. I refer to mass deaths in a particular village or community that is impacted by a specific hazard. So we go through that timeline, Cherry Hills landslide, 60 deaths, I'm going to go fast. 
Bengal and landslides in 2004, 135 dead. Debris flows in Infanta, 390 dead. Ginsa Ugon, 1,126 dead. 2000 uh, Durian, 1,399 dead. Typhoon Frank, 644 dead. Uh, in Ilo City. Ondoy floods, 465 dead in Metro Manila. Pepeng floods in Car, 465 dead. Uh, I forgot, RA 9729, which is the Climate Change Act, was uh, signed. And then in 2010, RA 10121, which is the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Law. And then in 2011, after that was signed, we had two disasters in Central Luzon, 97 dead from Petbring and Kel, and Sendong, 1,268 dead in CDO and Iligan. And in 2012, Project NOAA was launched. Uh, I think that was sometime in July of 2012. After that, uh, a month after, we had the Habagat floods, 9.49 meters rise in water level of Marikina. And then we had Pablo uh, floods that killed, um, uh, that did not kill anybody in, in, in Cagayan de Oro, although it killed uh, people in New Bataan, Compostela Valley. 2013 Habagat floods, nearly three basketball rings height combined, uh, but zero dead in Marikina. Habagat floods, uh, zero dead. We all had the Yolanda incident, uh, almost 10,000 died in that area. Uh, after that, the PIDRA or Pre-Disaster Risk Assessment of NDRRC was uh, instituted. And along with PIDRA was NOAA providing the hazard-specific area focus and time-bound warnings. We had Ruby storm surges. 1,664 houses were totally destroyed by storm surges. This was just a year after Yolanda, but there were zero deaths in Barangay Daram, in the municipality of Daram. Agaton floods, two dead in Butuan. They were warned beforehand. There's no rising water level here because when they were warned, nine hours in advance, the mayor was uh, so cautious not to get the water level sensor uh, to get wet. So it was taken out. I apologize for that, for not having a record in the rising water level. Senyang floods in Tagaloan, the worst floods that they ever experienced in 100 years, one dead. Inang floods, uh, very, very low deaths, uh, probably one dead in Nawak or zero deaths in. The list continues, Lando debris flows, uh, 30 million cubic meters of rock went down. It's called the debris flow, just 15% water, 85% rock. Cascaded and overwhelmed the town of Gabaldon. And in 2015, uh, two months after zero death, again with the debris flows uh, happening in the area. And the list goes on, uh, category five typhoons, Lawi with uh, very, very little deaths or zero casualties. And none here in this area. There was the Agos launch and then end of Project NOAA. After at the end of Project NOAA, within the NDRRC, where we, we did not provide any more the probabilistic risk assessment and the hazard-specific uh, time-bound and area-focused warnings, within 10 months, we had four disasters. Two in December from Urduha in Vinta, and then we had the Ompong landslide, and then the Naga landslide. Okay. So we just take a look, step back, take a look at what happened. We know that it's very important for an effective DRR system to have these two components, warning and response. Warning is the responsibility of government. It must be accurate, reliable, understandable, and most of all, timely. But it must be matched by appropriate response. And that is long-term education that involves disaster awareness, building, engagement of the people, getting them to have ownership about the DRR products that they use, and also access to maps that will tell them what to do. So you notice that uh, in the timeline, there were two disasters during the time from 2012 uh, up to 2016 or early 2017. We had two disasters there listed, one from Pablo and one from Haiyan. So you can see here, 
uh, what we call as a, a, an interview-based map showing the storm surge hazard given to them in 2010. And what happened was because this was the map, interview-based, they put the evacuation centers there. Had we had a probabilistic risk map which depicts a scenario bigger than what the community has experienced, then we could have easily seen that those areas were dangerous. Unfortunately, when Yolanda hit, we did not have that. Many people were put in the evacuation center. centers. They understood the warning, which was given two days in advance. They dutifully followed, went to the evacuation centers, but nonetheless, they died. That is because the maps, or hazard maps that were produced were a single scenario depicting the worst that the community has experienced. We need to use technology. We need to invest in the science and technology to be able to get us to see the hazards bigger than what the community have experienced. And these are called multi-scenario hazard maps and it's called probabilistic risk assessment if you talk about planning. So many people died, 70% of evacuation centers were destroyed. Here's another example. This map shows uh, uh, a deterministic type of assessment. Single scenario based on the interviews of people, based on the historical record. After the event, it was changed because it already happened. Now, in reality, what really happened, uh, what really happened is the evacuation center where 566 people were put was here and the river was just beside it. And nobody had an account that that river could swell. So what happened was when the rains came in, there was perfect warning by Pagasa of the amount of rain and the community was overwhelmed. Where 566 people, evacuees, died and got buried by rocks. Underneath this man, these are the rocks, two to three meters below are the 566 people who were evacuated but still died, but buried by the debris flows. In short, no amount of accurate warnings will work if hazard maps are inappropriate. We need to do probabilistic risk assessment and we need to reflect those future hazards bigger than what we have experienced. It is imperative. It is necessary. Local knowledge is good, it's necessary, but not sufficient. We have to complement that with science and technology. When I talk about multi-scenario hazard maps, we have a small storm surge, a bigger storm surge, another storm surge which is bigger than what the community has experienced, and climate change impacts uh, included. Storm surge bigger than what we could imagine, uh, but can be done or reflected or visualized using technologies. Same for landslides, same for floods, and if you do that, you still have a good uh, uh, map that will show you areas that are safe or the, the safest in the community. In terms of planning, we cannot afford just to limit ourselves, our analysis and planning up to the historical record. It must go beyond that. And we use technology to give us that information. This is a deterministic map, a single scenario based on the historical record as far as what the community has experienced. So if you use that for planning, you put the evacuation center there, uh, they would say, ah, it's safe here, it's okay. But in reality, that would be that would be what the technology would say if it's just the historical record. But if you go farther, a bigger event, which technology can get us to visualize as well, and another bigger event, you would realize that that place or development center or evacuation center or whatever you want to plan or build in a community would get devastated. We need probabilistic risk assessment. We need to capture the hazards of the future, which until now, despite the tools that are available, despite the investment that we made in 2012, it was a big investment, we're still not using it. Why open data? We use, we refer to science and technology uh, as uh, interdisciplinary, as, as necessary for DRRN. 
However, we have to go beyond that because we need to get musicians to play up, uh, to sing, uh, uh, to create songs and get people to sing songs so that we can raise disaster awareness. And we have to work with LGUs, NGOs, NGAs, everybody, just uh, 15 seconds or 30 seconds. And uh, what's important for us to be able to mainstream scientific information down to barangay level, you have to build trust. You need that trust to be able to communicate well. And if you don't have open access, you do not have open data, you do not have open science, you'll never build that trust and you'll never be able to communicate well with the people in the barangay. So these are concepts that are being used uh, by advanced countries, uh, Western countries, open data and probabilistic risk assessment. And it sort of, I think, uh, rattled the current system. And please, there's a law that includes open data, and there's a bill, sorry, it's not a law, there's a bill that includes the probabilistic risk assessment. Please make sure that it passes in the Senate as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lagmay. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Joel Joseph Marciano, who will talk about uh, space technology and applications, mastery, innovation, and advancement research program, or stamina for space. Dr. Marciano is a professor of uh, electrical and electronics engineering uh, at the UP Giliman, and also the director of Advanced Science and Technology Institute of the Department of Science and Technology. Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's my first time in UPDGC. Really proud of this building. Uh, I miss the University of the Philippines. I, I miss teaching. I've been away from teaching for almost two years. Uh, so I get my presentation started here. Um, yeah, I'm on secondment to BOST ASTI, Advanced Science and Technology Institute, wherein the past directors of that institute have curiously all come from electrical engineering for some reason. I probably wanted to continue that kind of tradition. Anyway, my talk is about stamina for space. Stamina is an acronym that stands for Space Technology Applications, Mastery, Innovation, and Advancement. And when we uh, came up with this title for our program, we were really trying to send a message a message both to our government and to our fellow Filipinos that if you ever go into space technology, um, one small satellite launching that into space does not make a space program, nor does it need a sustainable um, program effort. You know, we have to keep doing it, doing it, doing it better. So uh, after we launched the first satellite from our universities in cooperation with Japan, I told the team, let's forget about that. Stop referring to it as the first microsatellite because if you can't do it the second, the third, the fourth time, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. Um, do I have a paper? <clears throat> okay. Uh, let me walk you back to a history of computing. We're all familiar with this picture of uh, personal computers in a computer room. Right? And with the advent of the internet, we were able to put computers in remote data centers, massive computers doing a lot of computations, the so-called cloud. You know, when you connect to the cloud, you're really connecting to a remote data center. The anecdote is that the head of Amazon doesn't even know where his data centers are, right? where his computers are. Or it could be in Singapore, it could be in the US, etc. Those are, main, uh, those are the uh, big computers, rows of them, air conditioned 24 seven. We do have a couple of them here. Now, when you're doing computing, it's no longer confined to the realm of the specialist who does some fancy simulation or does some numerical computation, right? Things like this, that's computing, yes, but you can be updating your Facebook status. You can be sending out a tweet. You can be logging in somewhere, just checking your email. You are computing, and this has uh, brought this era of so-called social computing. So computing has become so accessible, everybody does it. We don't even know that we're computing. Right? Computers themselves are changing. If we uh, refer to them as the dull and 
boring gray and black boxes on our desk and our laptops, then we're mistaken. The computers now fit in the palm of our hands. Computers are on our wrists. They're, on the po they're in our pockets. Soon they'll be in our clothes, right? These are computers. They're becoming increasingly embedded in the environment. Um, so much so that it will go the way of the light bulb. The analogy is that it's electricity. Uh, back then, way back then, it was exclusive. But then it, there came a point where everybody, almost everybody has it. And so, so if you go someplace and there's no electricity, we think this place is rather backward. You know? We complain there's no electricity. So other technologies have had that similar profound effect. Right? Um, so this is a quote from Mark Weiser. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. It's kind of like a mantra you know, for us in engineering and technology development that we kind of uh, have internalized and says, you know, you, you become, you, you know you've done your job when you become irrelevant. Right? When uh, people took the technologies that you developed and communities take them and they adopted them and they sustained them, so now it goes into the back. <coughs> Wi-Fi right, uh, is another example of this technology that disappears. So I'm very happy that Wi-Fi here is free. I just have to log in and uh, you know, I just have to, I, maybe not even the registration, I just have to input a password and a username, but you go to a coffee shop and there's no Wi-Fi, we complain, right? Uh, let's not meet here anymore, let's go someplace else. The Wi-Fi is not free, right? So we take it for granted. <clears throat> but computers are vanishing and Computers are also vanishing in places that we probably don't expect. For example, in space. Right? This is uh, the WATA-1, the microsatellite we launched in April 2016, being launched from the International Space Station. These are not animation. This, uh, this is actual pictures taken by an astronaut on board the ISS when that microsatellite was being released. Okay. So you see here, inside that box, the size of Balikbayan size, a Balikbayan box size satellite are six computers. Uh, those in green, one, two, three, four, five, six, well, seven actually, uh, is a small computer here. Um, what do the computers do? They run the radio, they run the sensors, they take data from the cameras and they process it, they communicate with the ground, they receive commands from the ground, and then they do as they're told. Okay, this is a uh, shot of the water one from the, the, the on its bottom side, the side that normally faces down to earth. You see all the cameras there, a wide field camera, middle field camera, a high precision telescope, um, and the special camera here is a multi-spectral imager. That means a camera that we're not really accustomed to, um, when you take pictures with our cameras, you usually get color images, are red, green, blue, RGB cameras, but this camera takes pictures of different wavelengths so that uh, you can highlight different features on the ground, like vegetation or water, um, things like that. And so we can use it to map flooding, the extent of flooding. We can overlay it on maps of built up areas to see how the, where the flooding went, etc., or the loss of vegetation over time. Okay, so that's the other one. The future is small, they say, in the sense that these small satellites are really providing a viable beachhead strategy for countries like the Philippines to gain a vantage point from orbit, you know, 400, 600 kilometers up, for environmental observation and other things, right? For scientific Earth observation, also building an industrial base for space and capacity building. So small satellites are, are uh, providing that kind of uh, pathway. Okay. This all comes from, now uh, in engineering, uh, please indulge me here, there are three laws kind of we're all familiar with. You might have heard of Moore's law. Uh, there are two, then there's Shannon's law, and then there's Everready's law. Let me explain quickly. Moore's law is about hardware complexity. You talk about computers becoming more powerful, right? Uh, 20 years ago, we could not take videos on our cell phones. Now it's almost, we nonchalantly do it, right? I was watching Wimbledon in 2006, the finals of Wimbledon, and when Roger Federer was hoisting his trophy and uh, showing it to the crowd, I wasn't fixated on him, I was fixated on the crowd. And what they were holding up to take pictures of Federer were not point and shoot cameras, they were holding up their cell phones to take pictures of Mr. Federer. And I said, oh my gosh, point and shoot cameras, you're in trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was then, I said, you know, cameras, uh, well, it's been disrupt disruptive, right, cell phones. 
That's really because of the processing capability on our cell phones now are more powerful, and I can honestly say the power, the computational power of the cell phone in my pocket right now was more than the computer I used to write my dissertation. Right. So anyway, uh, so that's more so. Hardware complexity. What's accompanying that, what's also kind of driving that, is Shannon's law. It's algorithmic complexity. I, I speak of the example of taking videos, right? It takes algorithms to process video and images. So people are thinking of more and more complicated things to do, right? And we're building the hardware to do it. So that's th those two curves, right? We're ramping up. But what's not quite kicking up? Is Mr. Everready over here? Battery capacity, right? Um, so for those of you in chemistry, uh, studying batteries, etc., there's a potential for disruptive technology in that area, so that we don't have to charge our cell phones, right? Perhaps over months or years, etc. But then again, the message is we're doing a lot more complicated things with less, right? So with power-saving techniques, the reason why our cell phones now, despite all the complicated tasks that it does lasts as long as it does in terms of battery life is because there are very complex power management techniques. Our cell phone goes to sleep sometimes when we're not using it. Of course, you already know that it shuts down the display, etc. It also turns off certain processes that consume battery power while we're not using it. So those are litigation techniques. <clears throat> and uh, the three commodities, bandwidth, computation, and storage, prices are all going down as a consequence of that. So we see this disruption happening in the 1970s in order to have one megabyte, one megabyte storage. Can you imagine one megabyte? One megabyte. I, I don't even know what to do with that anymore. I can't use one megabyte. I need at least one gigabyte, right? One megabyte of storage in the 1970s cost the order of about $10,000. Right? And right now, in our pockets, we probably have 64 gigabyte uh, USB drives, right, for something like $10, or $20, okay. Right? So forget whatever it is that you've heard. The Philippines is not really launching satellites. Uh, what we're doing, we're putting computers in orbit. Right? So that's a perspective that we would like to share from this team developing these satellites. Right? So the question, question we ask is, but what on earth for? Right? Why do you want to put a computer in orbit? The answer is very simple. It's a four-letter word, data. Okay, what kind of data? Uh, well, data for enabling science-based, evidence-based policies and intervention. Data for enhancing productivity and inclusive innovation. Data for the fourth industrial revolution. Data like this, satellite images, all taken by our microsatellite from water turbidity, turbidity of Laguna Lake, with pictures all over the world, right? And as the Wato one is passing over the country, we point it. Uh, we take that for granted sometimes, the complexity needed to try to point a camera from 400 kilometers up to a location that's very precise. We miss sometimes, honestly speaking, when we try to take a picture maybe of BGC, sometimes the, the, the camera is actually taking a picture of Quezon City. So we're off. Um, so it takes, we're learning, in other words. So this is an example of a hyper multispectral image. I just want to discuss it very quickly. Taken over Mindoro Island. So the satellite passed this way, and as it was passing, it was taking a series of images capturing Semirara Island. And if you've heard, Semirara Island is an island where they do coal, coal mining. And you can see the extent of the vegetation here. This is a false color image where the red one, it shows the vegetation. You see where they do all the mining here. And of course, when they dig earth out, they have to put it somewhere, so then if they, there's kind of like a reclamation happening already over there. You see the outline of the island right there, and you see this earth in the water. Okay, so we, you can, if you try to do that over time, you can monitor these things. So that's data, and that's useful, hopefully useful information for, for our uh, planet and policy Right, uh, just quickly here, if you're interested in some of these images, you can go to this website, and you can just register and then download whatever it is that you want to download, uh, download everything. Uh, we don't really care, it's, it's really taxpayer money, so go ahead and uh, get it. Okay. Now, just one more thing, uh, Typhoon Ompong, you know, we use a combination of satellites, not just the Wata-1, okay? we use other satellites, so we were mobilized to take 
pre-disaster images of regions one, two, three, and Cordillera administrative region. Um, just to share what happened here, right? So after we take the image, uh, after after the typhoon, we take another image from the satellites that are available to us, and then we do the processing. We do the extent of flooding here. I think this is in Locos Norte, in Locos Norte, right? Uh, the message I'm trying to say is, we kind of come up, came up with our own metric for categorizing typhoons and other natural disasters. We call it the data mobilization index. Um, it refers to the amount of data and compute resources that we mobilize in preparation for and in response to natural phenomena. So we have this is the first time we've done it. Uh, we, we did something like this. We don't have a benchmark yet, but uh, Mongput or Hong Kong is kind of like a category eight. Uh, typhoon because it mobilized eight terabytes of data uh, from uh, from our repository archives of satellite images and also new satellite images. Right? We haven't really quantified the compute resources yet, but we will get there. So we'll go back to last year when we had a couple of typhoons. Uh, recently, we're also computing that for the landslide in Naja, how many resources we mobilized. The reason for this is we want to we also want to bring this kind of components into the conversation when we discuss natural disasters. Because it speaks of also the capability that DOST and the university are investing in, in this area to try to address uh, resiliency from the technology point of view, right? When you prepare before the disaster, that includes preparing all the satellite images that you have in the area, and when the typhoon passes, seeing what you have, and then doing change detection. Right? We also want that to bring, to bring that to the consciousness of everybody that there's this capability, and we're building on it, we're building it further, okay. probably. Can we speed up now? Um, okay. All the things that satellites can see from space, let me just quickly show you this interesting one. They monitor the shadows of oil tanks, right? Because apparently the lid of the tank dips when the volume of oil inside uh, corresponds to the volume of oil, so by measuring the shadows, they can measure oil inventory. Right? So it's not just for disasters, they, they can do this. Uh, for things like measuring the number of cars in SM Aura over there, right, and telling Mr. C, I have a formula by which I can predict your profitability for over the next few quarters based on historical data of the number of cars parked in your parking lot, and perhaps even what kind of cars are parking in your parking lot, etc. Very clever startups are doing this. Okay. These are the startups. So you can look at them from this up on the web. You can find out who they are. Okay. Now, uh, night lights as well. I have, I think, I have my time up, but let me just spend another bit here. Uh, we also use satellites to monitor night lights. This is Haiyan hitting Tacloban here. All the lights at night went out. And then we can track over time as it recovers. But every time a typhoon comes its way, the lights dip. And so it kind of impedes the progress in trying to recover. Right. Uh, we can do that with satellite images as well. Satellite images and night lights have been used as proxies for poverty, measurement, and economic activity as well. Okay. So it's not just about data, really. It's also about two more points. It's also about building a local industrial base. Right? What do we mean? When we build satellites, we also contribute components to it. Um, we want to engage our local industry partners. These are examples of hardware that we built in our labs that are going to, that are going to space. In the, in the second microsatellite launching three weeks from now, these will be on board as experimental payload. And these are designed in the lab, but we engage industry partners to fabricate them for us. And the skills get transferred to them, and if they're, so inter if they're interested in that, they can turn this into commercial products as well, among other things. Okay. <clears throat> and finally here, when we build satellites, we also build people. And our, our emphasis is really building T-shaped people. Uh, uh, for example, our electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, they, they don't remain, you can't build a satellite based on your domain specific expertise. You have to know what, you have to have empathy for what the mechanical engineer cares about, for what the materials engineer cares about. So we're building systems engineers. And we have, I think, a critical mass of remote sensing scientists here in this country. Uh, we want them to have empathy for data science. So new tools by which they can analyze the usual satellite images and get proxies from the information that they, uh, that they need uh, for those satellite images. Okay, <clears throat> so that's key shape people. Science and technology becoming interdisciplinary. The message to take away from this slide is don't just solve a chemistry problem, solve a clean energy problem, right? So it takes these T-shaped people and institutions to kind of 
challenge, uh, trying to uh, rise up to, to meet societal scale challenges. So when we talk about space technology, we're trying really to address a societal challenge, which is information poverty. Uh, can we provide information in a timely manner by which planners and policy makers can, can, can derive and uh, support more relevant and responsive policies? So that's, that's the idea. We build technologies along the way. <coughs> So these are the team members, right? Uh, just quickly here, I just want to make an announcement. Okay, there's a scholarship for localizing this program now. We're building CubeSats in our local labs. So January next year, there'll be a local graduate program in UP, Diliman, accepting master's students uh, in engineering and science who want to build CubeSats and launch them into space. Okay, so we are taking what we learned from Japanese universities and then translating it here and localizing it. And the water pool launch is, this is our flyer, we call it uh, D2, and our hashtag is D2NAMI. Okay? Um, <laughs> so you can say D2NMI, so you, we encourage people to take a snapshot of themselves as they're watching the rocket launch and then posting it, etc. So be participatory in that regard. Okay, uh, space technology requires stamina. You see here the example of different countries and the roadmap to space. We have only really just started. Vietnam started ahead of us, Indonesia, of course, South Korea. It takes more than one, it takes more than two, it takes more than three, right? So that's a message that we want to share. Um, but along the way, of course, it's not just about space, it's about information and trying to use these as computing platforms to be a, a data driven society and a smarter society. Okay. Market director, design thinking mindset, reshape people, institutions, and enabling environment. That's really a, a government support. That's really a, a formula for innovation in value creation. With that, thank you very much. Okay, the next speaker is Dr. Gray Samon, who will talk about challenges and prospects for the academy in the global gateway. Dr. Ramon is a faculty member of the Department of Political Science. I have 15 minutes, right? So I'll use up only five minutes maybe to give you an idea of our context in UB Clark. As you can see right now, I was I was uh, chosen three years ago to be the uh, director of UP Clark and Subic. The, uh, the official name is UP Diliman Extension in Pampanga and Olonga, what that means in Clark and Subic. And we all know that that place is as our, uh, our uh, uh, VC for, uh, for uh, academic, ac 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 uh, the one of, uh, of uh, the former chair, I forgot her name. She calls it the new frontier. And of course, we call it the global gateway because we know that at the moment, we have so many echo zones right there and we know that a lot is becoming so disruptive there, including the onslaught of so many corporations, as well as so many real estate uh, development happening. And of course, the proposed green city during the time of, uh, of uh, former President uh, Aquino, but now renamed New Clark City. Uh, I will be uh, joined by uh, a very illustrious uh, person who knows technology better than I do. That's why I got him to be our consultant as well as head of a project forthcoming and one that is already ongoing. Thank you for this opportunity. I wanted to show you UP Clark how it looks now. It's in a 3.8 hectare property, finally we got the land for it. It used to be only in a warehouse. It was UP San Fernando before, but now plays a very important role precisely because of the new developments in the area. One of those of which is actually uh, in the area of disruptive technology. ICT is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the niches that I thought at the beginning of my term that we should really, uh, we should really attend to, no? aside from other things. But early, early, early as soon as I arrived, there were challenges for academe that are not, that, or many gaps that, that at the very first instance I saw that academe isn't able to deliver at the moment, given the pace of, of development in the area. Uh, 
when, when I came, actually what happened was there were a group, for example, of Koreans who, who had to come to UP Clark and say, uh, what's happening to ICT education in this area? Because whenever, whenever we get people, they, do, they, they don't come up to par. CDC, the Clark Development Corporation, for example, convened all of the, uh, all of the, uh, the academic institutions in the region, in Region 3, that is, and uh, said that out of a thousand, for example, simply, simply our, our uh, BPOs there who, who want human resource in the area, that's why they are in Clark and Subic, report that out of a thousand, they can get only a hundred who are qualified for uh, the many positions there. So those are many of the challenges. Uh, as soon as we arrived, I was very happy with, uh, with Dr. Liliana. I will introduce him later. He immediately said that there is this demand for, for an implementation of what is called Women in ICT Initiative. Immediately, regionally, we implemented it, even if we didn't have the wherewithal uh, to, to do it, but we did it. We have hotels uh, around, around the echo zone, and so we, we convened uh, implementers in government, so that was our first taste of maybe if we train people in ICT, their work and their contribution will be disrupted and change the way things are. At the moment, we, uh, we also have a lot of projects that include innovation that we don't have here. Uh, we have social, social enterprise in UP Clark. We don't have it in Diliman. We have it in Clark. We are setting up a center for innovation and, uh, and uh, social enterprises very soon with a grant that we got from City Bank. We are also into the area of uh, advocacy in social mobility, in air, no? The uh, open skies policy has been always part of that. And now this uh, social mobility network that is being organized so that we can, uh, we can finally solve problems in emergency cases like Angeles and San Fernando, and of course, in Metro Manila. But that is not the, 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 what we're going to talk about here. I, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm in my like five minutes, right? So, uh, being an, acad an academic institution at the National University, we believe that we play a very important convening role. Convening role, doing partnerships, doing partnerships with both government, civil society, as well as, as uh, the locators in, in, the, in the echo zones. Uh, we made a study of Hanjin and we realized the governance challenges we came out, uh, we have report on that study, um, and uh, we realized that the challenges are great when you have an echo zone right there. And when you have an emerging city, the problem also of where do we put our, our uh, ITAS, our indigenous peoples, all that can be disrupted as well. So we thought that, that we could make a difference by way of really networking ourselves as the academic institution there with all stakeholders. That means the echo zone and of course the community and even the local government, the local government units. That is why this innovation that we thought we would do relates to the kind of work that we would like to do with local governments. It's entitled Digital Transformation of Local Governments in Region 3. And I have Dr. Emanuela Liana, I'm sure some of you, I think some of you here were former students or former, uh, for former people who were employed with his, uh, he is a colleague from the, from the Department of Political Science. He's now the Executive Director of IDEA Corp, Policy Advisor of the UN Asia Pacific Training Center, ICT for Development, and as we, some of you may know, he was former commissioner of CICT, now TICT. Dr. Emanuela Lana will discuss with us the ongoing, the ongoing uh, project that we have. Good morning, and thank you, Grace. Uh, so we're interested in digital transformation. How do we change local governments to make them better performing, make them more inclusive? And really the idea here is harnessing technology. But again, we would like to underscore that Technology, in a way, is the easy part. The difficult part is getting organizations to adapt technology, to use tech, to transform themselves through technology. And so, the, the uh, right. So, how can 
technology transform local governments? The first, of course, is more effective and efficient delivery of public services. At the local governments is where government, in a sense, is real to people. And that is where people constantly interact with government and they provide a number of public services. So it's critical that this interaction in terms of delivery of public services be enhanced and become more effective. The second point also is to include people in decision making and technology allows for better and faster, uh, better quality and faster decisions. And finally is to empower citizens to be part of governance. Uh, they are not just consulted perfunctorily, but actually participate in real terms, and technology holds the promise. Then there's also the externality, like when you have local government transform and become more digital, then it has positive effects in terms of the local community business, in terms of local well-being in general. But some of you may ask, is it this e-government? Is it this something that was introduced way back in 2000? Uh, and why are we calling it digital transformation now? Uh, the first problem with e-government is that it was just transforming existing processes into digital ones, which means there's no transformation. Effectively, what is happening is if your business licensing system was manual, we're going to make it ICT enabled. So government remains the same except now, now it's more efficient. Now that's not necessarily bad, but that's not transforming government. The other thing also is that we have new tools now. When we started off with e-government, we were talking of websites. We were talking of databases. Now we're talking of data lakes, right? Now we're talking of artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data and analytics. And all of these are more powerful tools that could really make government very different from what it was before. The question, of course, is, are we able to do that? Unfortunately, even in the US, and in the US private sector, 70% of digital transformation initiatives will not reach their stated goals. Right? Digital transformation is difficult. It is costly. Now, we have lessons learned from the US private sector and the UN and other Western country, uh, Western corporations. And we also have lessons learned in terms of public sector attempts at digital transformation. In the Philippines, most local governments have not yet engaged in digital transformation. Now, at best, what you've had are what we call digitalization, uh, the automation of existing process. And the best example for that is the electronic business permit and licensing system. So they just overlay an electronic ICT system over existing ones, which is lesson number one in ICT. You first re-engineer before you put on your new system. So even if it has, it's 10 years going and it's not, you know, it's not achieved critical mass in the country. Now why is that? There are at least 10 reasons for that. Right? The first is really lack of understanding. Um, many people in local governments really do not appreciate the potential. Some of them who do, they think of it as a nice to have rather than a need to have. And of course, there are a lot of vested interests going against a more efficient delivery of public services, in particular, more efficient monitoring and evaluation. Second is that there are many, too many comp competing priorities at the local government level. A lack of an overall strategy, lack of organizational agility, insufficient technical skills, insufficient funding, security concerns, lack of entrepreneurial spirit or the willingness to take risks, lack of collaborative sharing culture, and the lack of national policy and some legal constraints. So these are sort of the main barriers why local government units are not able to take on digitalization projects, much more digital transformation initiatives. So our project seeks to understand better 
the specific challenges faced by local government units in Region 3. Uh, the DICT the has been conducting an e-readiness survey, and a number of local governments in Region 3 have been topping that survey. And so, which means it is probably right, uh, Region 3, for a digital transformation initiative. The second one is we want to be able to transfer knowledge. We want to be able to assist local governments in planning, a, in doing a, a master plan for digital transformation. So we'd like to think that we have the skills that they need and that we could work with them to be able to come up with a realistic master plan for digital transformation in local governments. So thinking ahead, we're really thinking of four things that we could focus on in terms of the master plan. So we've done the review of related lit. Now we're choosing a partner with whom we're gonna work with closely to be able to develop a master plan. The first of course is orientation. Establishing a new perspective drives meaningful change. You've heard of citizen-centric government uh, and that is something that we wish to achieve also at the local government level. We have to focus on people. We want to develop the right competencies for digital transformation. And these are not just digital competencies, knowing how to use the computer, knowing, doing database and analysis and stuff like that. This is about increasing agility and responsiveness, ability to better integrate and connect information management excellence, people and business processes, reacting fast to often unexpected changes in stakeholders then, only at this stage do we look at technology, and technology as the enabler. So we want to understand how it's being used now, and we want to be able to upgrade the kind of technologies that they're able to deploy for government. And then, also, we need to look at the enabling environment, because you don't only look at the internal environment of the local government, but you also have to look at the external environment and to what extent that can help facilitate or hinder digital transformation. So maybe next year when we convene again, we'll have better results for you in terms of our experience at digital transformation, but this is where we're at right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ramon and Dr. Liliana. Our final presentation will be uh, by Dr. Cecilia Malamba-Lazarte, who will talk about the trials and triumphs of the National Integrated Research Program on Medicinal Plants. Uh, Dr. Lazarte is the Director of the Institute of Herbal Medicine. Good morning. Thank you to the organizers of this event. I'm again in a fish out of water, <laughs> uh, presenting to a different set of audience today. And we'll, I'll be talking about what we've been doing in our uh, institute and what our prede predecessors have also been doing. Okay, so switch gears. What we're doing is herbal medicine drug development and just a little background on what herbal medicine uh, is all over the world. No? In many countries, in Asia and African countries, 80% of populations depend on traditional medicine for their primary health care. This is also very big business, obviously, in China, where in herbal medicines reached up to $83 billion in 2012. It has a big a compound annual growth rate, and they estimate that by 2023, global sales of herbal products and remedies would reach around $111 billion. 
And many of the modern medicines we use today are actually derived from plants. Your age-old aspirin is from your salix alba. Your aceltamivir, which a lot of countries piled up on, uh, waiting for the flu epidemic, is for the treatment of influenza A and B. Atropine is from your belladonna. And artemether, our first-line drug for malaria nowadays, was actually derived from your Artemisia anua. And this won the Nobel Prize in 2015 for uh, the pharmacist UU2. I just like to uh, advocate a little and uh, try to educate all of us on what are the different tri types of herbal products in the Philippines. There are actually three types based on uh, the registration of the, of the Philippine FDA. You have your herbal or food supplements, your traditionally used herbal products, and herbal medicines. The first is your uh, food supplements. No? So herbal or food supplements are vitamins or minerals okay, with herbs or could be botanicals. And they're used as food, but it should not be the sole item of a meal or a diet. And they are not supposed to replace drugs or medicine. So they cannot make specific therapeutic claims. While the traditionally used herbal product can be registered if they have a claimed application based on usage for about more than five decades, no? for medical, historical, or ethnologic literature. So you would know it's a traditional used herbal product if it has a THPR number. And what we produce at the Institute of Herbal Medicines are herbal medicines. These can have specific therapeutic claims because we undergo a lot of the research wherein your synthetic pharmaceuticals also have. No? It undergoes preclinical safety and activity studies. It undergoes human trials, your phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And you would know a herbal medicine that it has an HMR number. So the, the predecessor of the Institute of Herbal Medicine was actually the National Integrated Research Program of Medicinal Plants, established in 1974. And this was a multidisciplinary team com composed of botanists, pharmacists, uh, medical doctors, uh, agriculturists, no? and chemists uh, put together so that they would they were all dedicated to the research of medicinal plants. If you see the very pretty lady on the left side, that is my mother. Unfortunately, only uh, one, two, three of the original pioneers are left. So this is the objectives of that program and are the objectives of the Institute of Herbal Medicine today to discover new drugs from plants, to discover substitute drugs from plants, make these discoveries available in community, to the community in various dosage forms, both community formulations as well as modern formulations such as tablets, capsules, suppositories, uh, sustained release uh, preparations, etc. And it would help establish a Filipino pharmaceutical industry. The secondary gains would include creating new cash crops for our Filipino farmers and conserving Philippine foreign exchange reserves and hopefully putting the Philippines on the world scientific map. So this is the algorithm of how we do our research at the Institute. Many times, if you start on top, no, there was a um, survey of more than almost 2,000 traditional healers from different regions of the Philippines. And we, and we tried to see what was the most common plants they use for specific indications. No? So basically what we are doing is putting uh, validation to what our folk healers have been doing and see if they actually work through uh, scientific methods. No? So we have different um, units at the institute. We have an agricultural unit who does research on cultivation, pro propagation, and harvest.
harvesting of these medicinal plants. We have preclinical researchers looking into the activity of the plants, both in the test tube and in animal models, as well as the safety of these plants. And if they pass these studies, only then would we be doing human trials, no? uh, the phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. We also have a formulation unit wherein they can help us make specific formulation, tablets, uh, ointments, etc., and do quality control on these specific formulations. At the end, we would like to uh, patent this, and it is also registered with the Philippine Food and Drug Authority. So these are the plant formulations that have already been developed. Your Lagoon B for cough and asthma, both a tablet and a syrup. Your Sambong, okay, for uh, urinary tract stones and as a diuretic. Your Acapulco lotion for fungal infections. Your Yerba Buena tablet for pain, both post-op, post-episiotomy, uh, post-biopsy pain. Your Ampalaya tablets for diabetes mellitus. Your Chaangubat for gastrointestinal and biliary colic, and your ulasimang bato for hyperuricemia. So allegedly, herbal medicine research is supposed to be shorter than your conventional medicine research, wherein uh, from target identification, validation, to your phase three tap trials in conventional med medicine usually takes around 10 to five years. And herbal medicine development allegedly takes five to six years. But of course, this is not the case when uh, we do our research because of the many challenges that we have. So one of the challenges that we had, especially in the late 70s and the 80s, is that this is probably disruptive. No? There was opposition from the Philippine Medical Association themselves. Of course, you know at that, well, until the present, multinationals uh, sponsor a lot of conventions and all the activities of your professional societies. And uh, putting herbal medicine out there might be competition for these particular entities. No? So there was non-acceptance. In one particular presentation, uh, this is a story by my mother which she repeats many times. She was doing a, presenting a project proposal to the, to the PMA and some other bodies and uh, she was actually told by the PMA president, well, he went towards her, put a uh, handkerchief on her head, and tied it on her head. You are now Mount Kepweng. And uh, uh, this seems to be all quackery. And my mother says, well, I'm proud to be Mount Kepweng, but we will still do this because I think this will help the Filipino people. Now, there also have been some challenges in terms of patenting. Uh, a lot of the, um, what do you call this, a lot of the funding, of course, comes from government. And they requested the team to publish a monograph on the Gunti. And of course, when they uh, went to the IPOFIL office to patent their, their product, they said there is already prior art, you already have a publication. You cannot uh, uh, apply anymore for the IP for 20 years. You can only apply for the utility model, which will give you only a exclusivity for seven years. Again, this happened when another researcher also published a article on Acapulco lotion, and, and again, they only got a utility model patent for this. I think I'll just go forward more. Okay. So also the Technology Transfer Act was not very uh, kind to the researchers before. 
the royalty was 60% for the researcher and 40% for the university. Now it is the other way around. Okay. But researchers in herbal medicine drug development are more than 20 probably per product. No? So what you get is actually very little. And majority of, obviously majority of the people who are into herbal medicine drug development is not there for the money. Also, we have a lot of red tape, difficulties in procurement. Okay, so let's go a little into the triumphs. Some of, some of the products actually, or the indications for the products didn't come from the arbolarios. It was serendipity, no? especially for Sambong. Sambong was actually uh, recommended by the arbolarios also for cough. And they did a uh, exploratory trial in some patients who had cough. They stayed overnight at, a, at their uh, research center. And the next morning they were asked, did it help your cough? Did it uh, alleviate your cough? And a lot of the uh, patients who participated in the study, well, kinda, it was, it was kinda okay for the cough, but I really don't like your, your medicine. Why? I was not able to sleep last night. Why not? I kept on going to the bathroom. Ihi kasi lang ihi. So that's actually how they found that some bong was a good diuretic. And later on, some of the patients also complained they felt a sandy material being passed out also in the urine. These were actually stones, kidney stones, that were being lysed by some bong, and they were able to pass out these stones. And of course, these were later validated in the, both the in vivo trials as well as the human clinical trials. So of course there have been some recognition both here and abroad for these pro, uh, products as well as some trademarks and there are some of them are already well known. Okay. Now Sambong is also a very uh, lucrative product it is actually the, uh, the category leader in this particular indication. No? For anti-urolithiasis products, it is actually the number one drug being prescribed by doctors, by neuro nephrologists, as well as urologists. So, Right now, there is a better acceptance by physicians uh, because of both the, what industry has done and what the academy uh, has shown the evidence that these drugs actually work. Okay, so this just shows that uh, for some bong, there are at least one, two, three, four, five, at least six um, manufacturers who bought the technology of some bong. No? So actually, there is the there is no monopoly because what is given is a non-exclusive license so that this would actually create competition among the producers the reason is that we want to keep the cost low okay. although we can talk about dollars and cents here we cannot quantify at the moment how many patients were relieved of cough and asthma by lagoon leak how many patients passed out the urinary tract stone by using some bone, or how many patients were spared of an expensive operation by using some bone, or how many farmers increased their take-home pay because of planting agundi and some bone, and how many hectares of idle lands were put to use by cultivating these herbal medicines. Okay, so uh, we just had the last the second herbal medicine summit last Thursday and Friday, and we had a good number of people who came from industry, from the academe, uh, from government, the WHO and the DOH were there, including the Philippine pharmaceutical industry, and we had a good exchange and developed some resolutions to push uh, so that government will help push this herbal medicine industry. So now we're still doing research. We've added uh, 
molecular biologists to our team to not only look at the cellular level on the mechanism of action of these drugs, but even look into the molecular level of how our herbal medicines work. So thank you very much. Uh, I was told that we have time for two questions. They have to be very, very good questions. For that uh, question, those are important concerns. Well, physically, communication with these satellites are more encrypted, and uh, there, there are certain information we do not disclose as far as how to communicate with them. Uh, at the same time, we work with our uh, relevant local agencies in terms of um, seeking the proper permissions and permissions. Right, so, the, so then these satellites also have limited lifetime. They're on low Earth orbit. They're only around for maybe 18 months up to three years. Uh, with the Iwata one, we're fortunate actually for it to be in orbit for three years. Next year it will decay, into orbit, decay back to Earth. Um, so there's limited opportunities to, to do that. Now international problems magnitude more. But at the same time, a country like Vietnam can build one on their own and then we can share these satellites and it passes over territories. So as their satellite passes over our territory, uh, we can ask them whether we can take images or vice versa. At the same time, their ground stations, we can exchange data uh, information to uh, some cooperation. So already with some of these satellites, we have a ground station network across 13 countries now that agree to cooperate in principle. And our satellite is actually the first platform for this cooperation. The Philippines is leading an Asian microsatellite consortium. Uh, in terms of developing a portal by which other countries can make requests to use your satellite assets and uh, try to task your satellite and get the data. So it's another platform for cooperation. Okay. Uh, so it's for Dr. Lazarte. Lazarte. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. You mentioned about the Technology Transfer Act of 2009. Um, I was wondering if you could share your experience with respect to its implementation and um, if you could suggest uh, ways by which we could further improve it. The main thing for the researchers was that the royalties were before it was in favor of the researchers, but now it was more in favor for the research institutions, wherein the royalties were 60% for the research institutions, while the researchers only got 40%. It works that way, especially that in in herbal medicine research, you're not alone in doing this. You're probably 20, 30 researchers you know, uh, having this passion to, to make this formulation. So uh, that's one, it, it was a, seemed to be a disincentive. Mike Parentilia from the Ansari University. I would like to address my question to Dr. Lagman. Is it? 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 Is
I'm just curious about the, uh, the, the Department of the Disaster Resilience, and I'm just wondering whether still the climate change mitigation is still uh, part of this uh, program. I don't, I don't know what would be the advantage of this over the other existing agencies that uh, deals with the climate change mitigation and disaster resilience action. Can you elaborate further about this uh, uh, resilience, uh, the Department of Disaster Resilience? I'm, I'm not the author of the bill, okay? and there are 167 authors of that bill, uh, the bill being a, an offshoot of the, what we call as the Sunset Review, which is, the, which is a provision in the uh, RA 10121, which is the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Law. After five years, stakeholders are supposed to be consulted and then after they are consulted uh, they, they come up with that review and that was the basis of that new Department of Disaster Resilience Bill. So they improved that they, uh, based on the recommendations and the, uh, the suggestion was to create this department to be able to have a single chain of command for those agencies that are directly involved in disaster risk reduction efforts, including climate change adaptation. So the budget, from what I've heard, for next year in 2019 is 51 billion. And uh, if they are separated in different agencies, I, I surmise that uh, each department has their own program. They may be coordinating, they may be consulting with each other, but not as much as if, uh, as if they are in a single department. So well-coordinated, well-planned, a single chain of command, uh, that is the essence of that uh, DDR, the Department of Disaster Resilience. Again, which is a recommendation of the Sunset Review. Now, you're asking if CCA, or the Climate Change Commission, is still there. Yes, there's a Climate Change Office. In fact, the CCC is still, the commissioners will still be there. But instead of being under the Office of the President, it's going to be under the Department of Disaster Resilience. I'd like to add that uh, people are asking whether OCD and NDR or MC will still be there. Yes, wholesale OCD will be the one, the key agency that will operate the Department of Disaster Resilience. How about the Council? Because we are dealing with climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, we need to do anticipatory planning, and planning must be across all sectors. Health, tourism, energy, mining, uh, education, coastal environment, etc. It needs to be a whole of government approach. That means that all agencies must be included. And the NDRRMC, which is called as the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, uh, represented by all agencies of government, will still be there. Wholesale will be uh, put into the DDR. And that will be a council that will be renamed. It's not going to be NDRRMC anymore. It's called NDRC, or National Disaster Resilience Council. So basically, these things, like the CCC, like the NDRC, like the, the Council, and the OCD, will be just put in the Department of Disaster Resilience. But technically, those concerns about NDRMC being abolished is not true. OCD being abolished is not true. And the CCC being abolished it's not true. This is part of, I think, what we call as uh, disruptive, uh, disruptive uh, 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 science and technology, or what, uh, or a new system that we want to develop. And when you want to institute change, those who are entrenched in the status quo will try to oppose it. And these questions that arise, that they are going to be abolished, is actually, actually just manufactured. You can get the actual version of the House bill. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, saying this based on what I saw on the website of Congress. 
uh, House Bill 8165, they published what was approved by the Joint Committee on uh, Appropriations, and the National Defense, Government Reorganization, and as approved by the Committee on Appropriations and passed on second reading or third reading uh, by Congress with a vote of 181-5-2 in favor of the proposed House Bill 8165. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galmay, Dr. Seratica, and all the other speakers for session 